All right, what's up, Soul Splitters? This is Steven, Nathan, and Dan with the Harry Potter episode. We're covering Harry Potter and the Half Blood Prince books. It's getting close to the end here. So, guys, are we pumped or what? Book six, right? Yeah, I feel way lucky to be on here. It's like I had a Felix Felices potion or something. Yeah, yeah. Six. yeah. These uh, these reviews would be nothing without Dan's wizarding dad jokes. <laughs> Steven, I do have a question um, that I haven't had a chance to ask for a few weeks. What does reading by reading beyond the Raffo mean? I'm referring to your intro for each of the podcasts. Yeah. So do you know what Raffo means? No, that would be my question, I guess. <laughs> so Raffo is an acronym. R A F O. R A F O. Is R is the R reading? R is just read. Read after. And read and. For, read and figure context, it out. F- and close. Figure it out. Read and find out. Read and find out. So when someone asks you a question that's kind of, it would be better if they discovered the answer on their own, you say Raffo? Yeah, you would say Raffo. Usually it's more like an author saying Raffo. I think Robert Jordan actually came up with this term. And it was when people would ask him, like, give a theory or ask, like, oh, what does this mean? Because there's a lot of prophecies in the Wheel of Time. He would say Raffo. And then now a lot of authors do this as well. Sanderson does it quite a bit because people have a gazillion theories about those types of books. Oh, got it. In my preparation for the Half-Blood Prince discussion, I was hopping back in the time machine and some people were talking about how J.K. Rowling was revealing a few choice things before this book like she revealed some things about scrimgeour or something else i guess that was that, pretty big news at the time for sure just it sparked a lot of speculation little tidbits back in like 2004 that people were talking about showing up on like aol instant messengers yeah i yeah. think so did I, did I date myself is that the correct dating for aol instant messaging <laughs> it's in the range Close Something enough. like that. All right. So we're going to switch up our format a little bit this time. In Woo-hoo. the past, we have, yeah, very exciting. In the past, we've just talked through the plot and it's been me kind of like droning on about what happens next, et cetera, et cetera. Boring, right? We don't want to do that anymore. So instead, no, we're going to... Slight disagree, Stephen. You, know, you always do a good job of summarizing. Yeah. I mean, I think so too, but you know, we're, we're trying to switch up. So instead of doing that, we're going to talk about characters. So our discussion is going to be very character based. I'm going to give you guys a character and we all have a bunch of thoughts and notes written down. And so we are going to go through the characters. We can talk about any events really in any order. We'll just kind of jump around. And then by the end of all the characters, I think we'll also have discussed all of the big events and then we can do our top three and bottom three characters and then it'll be a wrap. Yeah, you're probably right. I think, well, because every every key event in the book of course involves a main character so if we discuss all the characters then we should be hopping through the plot pretty efficiently as well exactly and before we get started shout out to our recent patron patreon member that just joined b and die so thank you for your support and we appreciate having you as a patron and if you want to support phantology you can find us online at www dot phantologybooks.com it's got our full catalog we've got things like robert jordan and brandon sanderson jim butcher dresden files we just finished reading that series so if you're a fan of that if you like anything from like joe abercrombie to harry potter to what golden compass philip pullman i mean all, all, all kinds of stuff so go and check us out there give us a listen i know that you guys you, i mean dan you've read red rising we've covered that Nathan, anything that you're like looking to read pretty soon? Um, I'm I'm still making my way through uh, Words of Radiance. Okay, um, getting ready for the the big like release. 12. Yeah, Chapter, yeah. There's over a hundred chapters, so keep on going. Yeah, I'm still going there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yeah, check us out, and then if you also want to support the channel, you can do that at Patreon.com/slash/Phantology underscore books and there are some exclusive tiers etc and join our discord and talk with us more we just recently upgraded our discord to what i'm calling phantology 2.0 so you can go in and choose whatever 
series you like, and then channels will magically appear and people will talk to you about those things. So yeah, I like that feature. Yeah, I was I was on Discord. There were a few of the channels that I did not feel very connected to, seeing as how I hadn't read those particular series. So I was able to block those out right, and focus right. on the stuff that was more relevant to me. So and good upgrade. You, yeah, and once you finish, once you finish a series, you can go in and add that channel too. It's very, it's very nice. Like very, very advanced. The whole world opened up to you with insights of the book you just finished. Absolutely. You can unlock. All right. So I want to start by talking about Dumbledore. Dumbledore, right? Our man Albus. Huh. He was huge in this book to take a Trumpism. He, I think he was <laughs> like, this was the book for Dumbledore, right? Like we'd bagged on Dumbledore quite a bit in previous books. Like, oh, Dumbledore's not doing anything. He should be leading the charge. He's so hands off. But Dumbledore finally picks up here, right? Am I crazy? Wait, is, Do you guys agree? Is he not still a little bit too hands off in this? I mean, he, uh, no, I, to an extent, I, but he really brings Harry in. So I have been known to really like dislike Dumbledore throughout the series. Yeah, Dumbledore I, and Ron. We know that you Dumbledore don't like either of those characters. Yeah. Um. But throughout this book, um, just rereading it, I really like Dumbledore's character throughout this book. Um, just the different stuff he does. He takes Harry in. I mean, now I think it's the perfect time for him to teach Harry about the Horcruxes and tell him how he can defeat Voldemort, bring him in. I mean, it's kind of now or never, right? Like he knows yeah. he's dying. Yeah, exactly. And so, I mean, if it's if he doesn't do this, then Harry's kind of, I mean, he, he, Harry's not going to figure anything out, really. I mean, he has Hermione, but Hermione doesn't know a whole lot. I mean, it, I, it, it would just take him longer than usual. I guess that's a slight spoiler for uh, book seven, but I'm guessing you've probably read the books by this yeah, point. Yeah, when i yeah, it, you don't know in the sixth book what the withered hand actually means, but it's, it's going to be hard to get that. At least for me, when I'm analyzing characters in this book, it's going to be hard to avoid spoilers for book seven. All right, we're doing spoilers for Is book that... seven. <laughs> okay, yeah. So let's, if, if for let's some reason we're getting that out there, if for some reason you haven't read Deathly Hollows, we're going to talk about the ending of the books. But I'm at like clear your mind for a second, obliviate your mind or whatever, pretend you don't have any knowledge of book seven freeze time at the end of book six so you know that harry first of all the locket that he discovered is the fake locket so how many horcruxes does he still have left to find five so there's seven total seven total and, and he's already he taken out the diary five. he's taken the out diary the diary and the, ring. and the ring are gone so there's, so there's five, five left do you count the and locket or no no, you don't count well, the locket because they because haven't worried. discovered yeah, you don't know fake. who okay. rab is or anything yeah, yeah so the odds are seemingly pretty insurmountable like if i didn't know anything else in book seven i would have thought that there would still be clues that dumbledore had left um that are yet to be revealed in book seven mm -hmm. and granted dumbledore did leave a little bit of trails um through his accomplice which i won't talk about even though he said we're just gonna we would spoil book seven so i am a little bit aggravated that dumbledore didn't leave more behind i don't know yeah like I more about like the hollows because um but, I, i'm just saying that at the point of time at the end of book six it seems like everything has to break exactly perfectly right for harry to be able to um accomplish the seemingly insurmountable task of defeating lord voldemort and all of his horcruxes yeah yeah especially when you look at how hard it was to get into the cave like one cool thing that I thought about Dumbledore was it revealed how good and advanced his magic was. Like we start getting exposed to the nonverbal spells, which are very hard for even advanced wizards. And Dumbledore mm -hmm. is obviously a master of all of that jazz. And he kind of feels the walls of the cave, thinks to himself for a little bit and then discovers where the opening is. And he figures out how to get across the water and all that cool stuff. Mm hmm. Um, which it obviously increases his credibility quite a bit, like makes you understand why he's so revered. Yeah, he goes full on Gandalf towards the end of this. Yeah, I mean, but if it, we're going like spoilers for book seven, my biggest takeaway is why didn't he give Harry the sword of Gryffindor before he died? If he knew like what he was capable of, why didn't he give it to Harry or mm. 
put it somewhere where Harry could find it. So that way they could have it a whole lot sooner than when they did. Yeah, that, that seems, I don't know. There could be some reason for it. I'm sure you could come up with some plot armor for that. But mm. it does, yeah, it, that does seem a little questionable. I'm with you there. But, I mean, overall, I really like Dumbledore in this book. I, I, I liked how he took Harry under his wing at the very beginning and how he told him basically what he was trying to do with Slughorn instead of making a whole secret and I, yeah I mean, total I'm, total tone shift from book five right yeah. where it's like can't talk to harry or even look at harry now it's we're telling harry everything and granted like he's still the big thing he doesn't tell him is anything about snape but i think yeah. there is a reason for that like i, I don't think harry, harry still couldn't know right because snape still had a, a very important role to play and I think it was important yeah. for Harry not to understand everything that was going on there. But it's um, still a little yeah. maddening. One thing that helps me feel a little bit more comfortable about it is I'm wondering if Dumbledore was thinking that there was still a perfect link between Voldemort and Harry's mind that he couldn't reveal too much without also revealing it to Voldemort. Mm. But Harry seems to kind of master occlumency or maybe not master, but that doesn't seem to be as much of a problem progressing through and in fact in the seventh book harry seems to see into voldemort's mind more than vice versa well i think part of that in book seven without going too much into it is that voldemort is slowly dying as harry goes and he destroys these horcruxes so that voldemort's mind is breaking down a whole lot easier huh does that make voldemort less powerful to have a horcrux destroyed i, I don't know yeah i could see that i haven't thought about that before nathan I, I mean, I just feel like that. I mean, how would you feel if part of your soul that you have torn and put into something else dies and you don't have sure. your soul? Sure. Kind of hard to imagine, but yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> the yeah, go We don't get it. I mean, it's not a super hard magic system where we understand like, okay, one seventh of his power is here. So if it's gone, what does that mean exactly? It's more just like a, a rendering of who he is almost. But I don't think his magical ability is decreased, but I'm not really sure. Yeah, unknown. But uh, going back to Dumbledore and specifically that cave scene, I think we get an insight to the vulnerability of Dumbledore for the first time. For the first five books, he's kind of just this character that's always in control at all times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you get a glimpse of something unsettling from his past for sure when he's crying out, when he's in pain. And it really exposes all that and leaves it all out there. So that leaves you wanting to understand more about that part of Dumbledore's character, which I liked. Which then you get in the seventh book, in Deathly Hollows. Yeah. So that, yeah. that is a good setup. Yeah. But, I mean, it, then it does go on to like foreshadow in book seven of when they come back and Harry and her, her Dumbledore go back to Hogsmeade. And like Dumbledore is specifically telling you, Correct me if I'm wrong, but he's like telling Harry to find Snape. Yeah. And yeah, he, he wants yeah, Snape because Snape, Snape can help Snape. him. Yeah. yeah. And Harry's like, I mean, throughout the whole series, Harry has no reason whatsoever to I trust mean, Snape. To trust Snape. And well, well, not even trust Snape, but Harry's always actively worked against Snape and considered him like his ultimate enemy. enemy. Yeah. And yeah, so, and he feels pretty vindicated at the end of this book for, for all sure. of his conspiracy theory thoughts. So one question I had about Dumbledore and the whole memory thing and the Horcruxes and this stuff that Harry and Dumbledore were doing for most of this book, why did he need the memory from Slughorn so much to confirm the whole Horcrux theory? Because wasn't he already working on this as if it was true and he was tracking these Horcruxes down and he had the ring and he knew the diary was destroyed. Like, did he really need this memory where, where Slughorn actually said the word Horcrux and explained like, that, that just seems so weak to me. Well, we do know that Dumbledore had knowledge of the Horcruxes because it said, um, Tom Riddle said that, or where, where was it that it said that Dumbledore had banned the talk of Horcruxes at Hogwarts? Or am I imagining that? I don't think but was, obviously yeah. he knew something about it. He knew about it, and he, he had the half the memory where Riddle asked 
Slughorn, what's a Horcrux? Yeah. And yes. then he was um, tracking them. Why did he need the memory of Slughorn's is, response? I, I think the big thing is the number. The We're number seven. Like, when Riddle Wait. was saying, what if someone's to split into seven pieces? Yeah, I think that's the big okay. thing. Because then okay. they knew how many they were looking for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But- and then again, Harry was, I mean, spoilers for Rurik 7. Harry was the Horcrux that Voldemort never made. I mean, intentionally made. intended to make, right? Yeah. And so if Harry's 7, then was Voldemort really going to make another Horcrux at that point? Let's talk about that in the seventh book. We'll, we'll shelf that mm-hmm. for now. But nice. I think that that's a good response. I mean, I was trying to point out a plot hole and you shut me down with saying that it that's was right. the seven. I got so, your uh, back, JK. Yeah, so I'm on I'm on board with that. Anything more about Dumbledore? Like, I mean, he dies at the end, right? That well, that's a thing. Well, should yeah. we talk about because I doubt we're we're gonna talk about the gaunts and the just the memories in general, because we're not gonna talk about those characters, are we? So we can I talk about in to- the context of Dumbledore. I wanted to talk about Voldemort specifically. Oh yeah, we'll talk about Voldemort. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's get to that when we get to when we get to Valdi. So let's talk about Dumbledore dying. So Dumbledore, a hundred percent commitment to the cause, sacrifices himself for Harry, for this whole thing that he's been trying to do for I mean most of his older wizarding well, wife. Yeah. You know, shutting down Voldemort. Really admirable. And even at the end when he knows he's gonna die, he's trying to talk Draco out of it. And he knows that Snape is going, like, he knows at this point, he, he's fully committed. I mean, part of it is because he, he knows he's going to die from the hand curse anyway. But I think it's really admirable. And this is really where, you know, this is a gut punch when, when Dumbledore does finally die. It's tough to read. Yeah, it's definitely a sad, one of the sadder moments in the book when, when Dumbledore dies. What was worse, Dumbledore or Sirius? I Three thought Dumbledore years. was worse. Oh, did you say serious, Nathan? Yeah, 100% serious. Well, you know that Dumbledore was worse because they gave you like an entire chapter of the funeral procession and all of that to really get some closure on it. Yeah. You know that in J.K. Rowling's mind, Dumbledore's death was way more devastating. I, I, I just feel like Dumbledore got more like that because he was, I mean, he was the professor, I mean, headmaster of Hogwarts. There are a lot Whereas- more people around him and everything. Yeah, I mean, Dumbledore's Sirius touched a lot more like people. Ten people. Whereas Sirius was like a convicted killer. Yeah, and so he had no one to go to his funeral. <laughs> and I, I just feel like Sirius is a lot more thinking it as like Harry's perspective. I would go with Sirius because he's like his only family that he's had left. But I feel like Dumbledore was getting closer to filling that void. Like, even as cool as Sirius was, Sirius and Harry never had a cool bonding moment like Harry and Dumbledore did when they retrieved the fake locket. Oh, yeah. Like, they were just getting started. The Harry and Dumbledore crew off to destroy all the Horcruxes. If only Dumbledore was lucid, that would have been such a great moment for them. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, Sirius Sirius offered that, that moment to live with Harry. Yeah, in the the third, at the end of the third, sure. Yeah, that was touching. Sirius, look, I mean, he wasn't a great role model for Harry. He was oh, still no. kind of a punk, still a bit of a rebel. Dumbledore, I think, is worse. Dumbledore touched a lot more lives, and he deserved the big funeral. And, and while Sirius was sad, sure, for Harry, and for a reader, I mean, we're all kind of fans of Sirius, Dumbledore's the better character. He's the better wizard. And you've been fed all this propaganda throughout all the books like, oh, everyone's safe as long as Dumbledore's around. Or maybe not even around, but as long as he's in, in the vicinity Honestly, or in the same there, country, yeah. then you're safe at Hogwarts. And now the rug is totally pulled out from underneath that. And you have no idea what to, what's coming up in the future. Yeah, not, even, not even propaganda. I mean, look to the end of Order of the Phoenix when Dumbledore comes in and saves the day. Yeah, and he takes on Voldemort. Yeah, I guess that's true. I just like Sirius yeah. more as a character. You like the bad boy a little more? A little Billy Billy Eilish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sirius is like the cool uh drummer. And maybe Dumbledore's the the lead singer. Actually, no, that doesn't work. No. Forget about that. No. <laughs> He's the bass Dumbledore's player. Dumbledore's <laughs> like like the old like manager of the band or something. You could say that, but not a lead singer. 
Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how far this analogy goes, <laughs> but, uh, but anything else on Dumbledore before we go, I want to talk about Harry next. Okay. I, I we're getting the big guns out of the way early. Okay. Let's transition in this way. So I thought one of the more, one of the more transitional moments was when Dumbledore says, Harry, I need you to get this memory from Slughorn and I need you to do it. And he trusts Harry to do it. And I thought this was huge because previously Dumbledore has like never really shown any actual trust in Harry. He's just kind of said like, Oh, good job, Harry at the end of the year or no, Harry, I'm not going to tell you what's going on. But in this case, he's saying like, Harry, I have a mission for you. And then mm-hmm. Harry doesn't really do it. And, and Dumbledore's like, I'm really yeah, which, disappointed in you, Harry. Which, of course, he procrastinates a la yeah, yeah, Goblet he, of Fire he, clues or yeah. other parts yeah, of the books. Exactly. Because of his obsession with Malfoy. But I thought that was a big moment for Harry and Dumbledore. So now let's talk about Harry's character in that he is getting this larger role with Dumbledore. I mean, he's probably feeling pretty good about this these private classes and everything that he's getting. Yeah, I like how he kind of puts some of the more minor aspects of his life to the side. Like you can tell that he knows where his focus needs to be. And even when he's focusing on Draco and battling the Death Eaters, when everyone's telling him that it's stupid, um, which actually ends up, he ends up being the one that's right at the end, which is um, new in this situation. But I like how he doesn't think about Quidditch as much, for example, like probably if you would have handed him the reins as Quidditch captain in in an earlier book. Uh Uh-huh. He would have been way more stressed about that, but he kind of just does his baseline duties and not much further. Even the romance at the end, the budding romance, he's able to uh, postpone that and tell Ginny that it's got to be on hold. But his whole focus is uncovering the past and the lessons with Dumbledore. He's not even as focused on school. Like you hardly hear about school with Harry in this book. Okay, so a lot out of that comment, Dan. That was a lot of good stuff there. Um, let's start with the Quidditch thing. So, and, and maybe the Draco thing as well. So after coming out of book five, where he got completely played at the end by Voldemort with the whole serious trick, I can't believe that he is so, he gets so enamored with yet another thing that is like so similar with the Draco Malfoy as a Death Eater type of thing. You know, you, you think mm-hmm. that like, maybe he would have been talked out of it a little more or, or thought back to man, like I got totally fooled by Sirius. Maybe I should not go all in on this, but Harry is just all in on everything he does. I mean, that's his character. So I thought this was really interesting. And like you say, he was actually right, but he wasn't able to actually do anything about it either. Yeah. I just feel like Harry at this stage in his life, like he, like, has fought Voldemort like four or five times and he's moving on he's ready for to go on and that's why like I feel like that's why Quidditch and everything else isn't as big as his life because he knows there's something more than just school right? he's put he his knows, name in for the draft he, he's he's ready to get out of the amateurs a little bit yeah he knows he like he knows that he has to fight Voldemort it's going to come down to that and so He's been reading that Daily Prophet, Chosen One stuff all summer. Yeah. The, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's getting to, I mean, I feel like it's getting to his head where he's like consumed by it because he, he doesn't have anything else, right? Like he lost Sirius. That was a big thing for him. And now he has to prove himself that he can actually do something. I feel like but, he handles it pretty well, though. I mean, book five was all about Harry Potter and the teenage mood swings. But mm. book six, he's much more grounded and he's oh, had he's all this stuff happen. Yeah. Yeah. Real yeah. He big doesn't step get forward. sucked into the he doesn't get sucked into the fame at all, even. He stays really humble throughout the book. Um, but Steven, you're saying that if you were Harry, you would have been a little suspicious that all of this Malfoy stuff was like a trap by set by Voldemort. Like, Is that what you're saying? Fame? Yes. I mean something yeah. I mean, I got totally played. At the end of the fifth book, my godfather died. And at that time, it was a similar type of situation. Everyone was telling me like, Harry, uh, I don't know about this. You know, watch out. And then now all of a sudden I'm jumping into another one where I'm like, Malfoy's the Death Eater. Eh. I, I don't know. I just, I, I would doubt myself a little bit more. I would want more support from other people. If I was going to go all in for this, I would be like always looking for affirmation from someone else 
rather than ignoring all of all of their uh, skepticism. But it is it is pretty suspicious, I think, Malfoy's actions throughout the books. Yeah. You definitely know there's something going on. Like at the um, beginning of the book when they when they're in Diagon Alley, they go to the store and they see Malfoy, right? And they were following yeah, Malfoy. Yeah. Like that's I mean, I feel like for Harry, like a sixteen year old, I mean, that's pretty suspicious. But yeah, look, I how much like of that Harry, is because I mean, as the reader you read chapters one and two and you know that Malfoy is up to something because it's, it's it's explicitly told to us in those beginning chapters and Snape is going to watch over You're talking him. about, okay, yeah. When yeah, Snape all, all of that. I agree. So we're okay. reading the books. We're like, yeah, we know Malfoy's bad. Totally. No that's one else true. knows that. No one else yeah, knows that. Yeah, that's in the back of our minds the whole time. Um, I think for Harry, he might feel a little bit yeah, more invested is... based on what happens on the train because he gets like totally gets, owned by Malfoy he when owned. he tries to uh. use the invisibility cloak and Malfoy um, stuns him and and then he like stomps on his face too, right? And breaks yeah, his nose. Yeah, he breaks uh-huh. his nose and stomps on his face. So that's uh-huh. gonna make Harry eager to to prove that Malfoy's evil and yeah. Do you guys have any more thoughts on that moment? Because that was a big moment. I have a couple things on that. Yeah, I just. Feel I mean, it was like pretty messed up. He was very immature, of Harry. <laughs> Um, I mean, again, Harry, just, I just feel like Harry at this point he wants to prove that he is the chosen one, and that, especially after book five when he gets tricked by Voldemort, he wants to prove that he's ready and that he's changed from this fifteen-year-old to this sixteen-year-old. I think it's a super personal battle for Harry, and if he has an opportunity to jump in, get an advantage on Voldemort, try to thwart a plan, he's going all in for it. He's super impulsive. He always has been. I don't, I don't get the logistics of how it worked out on the train with the invisibility cloak because how big are the different cabins on the train or the different rooms on the train that he can fit in? And we know that Pansy's in there. We know Crab and Goyle and Malfoy. Like, obviously, if you have the invisibility cloak, you're invisible, but it doesn't mean that you don't occupy space. So how could Harry feel so confident yeah. um, invading that space and not thinking that somebody's going to bump into him accidentally or something? That was stressing yeah, me out. I mean, I just think of it, it was a regular train. I don't know, maybe got up like where the. I mean, just up in the up in the luggage it. somewhere. Yeah, yeah. He he definitely uh, rolled pretty well for dexterity if we're playing D and D, and he was able to clamber up into that compartment without anyone seeing. Compartment. That's what I was trying to think of. Yeah, the train uh, compartment. Okay, so nice on that yeah, on that moment. Poison. So I thought it was a big moment for two for two reasons. One, because it sets up Malfoy at Draco as being a very a pretty quality opponent, right? Like this isn't, it, Draco's always been a fairly competent wizard. Like he's not a crab and goyle goon level, but you've always mm-hmm. kind of, like Harry's always got the upper hand on him. You know, Hermione has a nice moment where she punches him in the face in the third book. The, the, the heroes have always been able to defeat Malfoy. And so you think, okay, yeah, Harry's suspicious of Malfoy. We're going to defeat him again. But at the beginning of the book, Malfoy totally owns him, right? Kicks him in the face almost sets him back pretty far by leaving him on the train with the invisibility cloak over him. Like it's real, it's a, it's a bad moment for Harry. So it was good for that reason, because now the conflict has some stakes and Malfoy is someone we want to try to defeat. And it was also really good foreshadowing for the end when Harry is also under the invisibility cloak watching Malfoy and the whole Dumbledore showed up. Oh, I hadn't thought about those parallels. I didn't think about it like that. Yeah, but I do. I did think that it was really important for establishing Malfoy as a formidable opponent because he wasn't before. Okay, what else about Harry? There's a lot of good moments here. We got to talk about the Ginny Harry romance. All right, so you moving like? on past yeah. Cho to Ginny. Yeah, big upgrade. Okay, so I know. Well, first of all, what do, you, do you, are you guys fans of the romance? Yeah, I think we like it. Did it? Did it meet? Did it need more development? Is what I'm trying to say. Did it need more of a backstory? Because that's a complaint that I've heard a lot. I think Ginny was developed as someone that Harry certainly would have noticed. Yes, in the last book and this book, like she took some big step forward. Yeah, she took some big steps forward to the point where, yeah, it makes sense that Harry would think she's attractive and someone you know that worthy of his attention because she's really cool. 
Yeah, I definitely had a change of heart on the most recent reread. Ginny is obviously who should be the target for Harry. Like when Harry finally notices Ginny and you know that he kind of has her in the bag or like she might be wanting to reciprocate that love because she's shown it before. And all the way back to like book two. Yeah. Yeah. And we know that off camera, like Ginny and Harry have spent a ton of time together throughout all of the years and especially the last couple of years when he's been at the Mm -hmm. borough quite a bit. So I don't think we really need it explicitly told to us because you know that Harry's awesome. You know that, well, albeit probably a little bit awkward around the ladies, but he's awesome. Like he's a catch. You know that Ginny is like Ginny is, I think this book should be called like Harry Potter and Ginny is a freaking boss because Ginny makes no mistakes throughout this book. (laughs) Um, So yeah, they seem like a really, they seem like a natural (laughs) match. (laughs) Yeah, I think we're all cheering after the the cup was won due to Ginny, of course. Yeah. And and then the big kiss came in. I think that was a that was a high for everyone. I I, I do not agree with anything that was just said. Wow. Yeah, please elaborate. Oh, it's because of the Hermione thing, right? Yeah, because Harry should be with Hermione. Unpopular opinion coming up, Ginny <laughs> Weasley was cooler than Hermione in this book. Oh well, yeah, I, she, I do not think this was a strong Hermione I, book. I, I I mean I she Ginny Weasley's a great character, but just the whole way that the books are lined up and everything, Harry should be with oh, Hermione, man. not Ginny. All right, we got to move past this one because I think uh, <laughs> listeners have probably heard this a few times. <laughs> All right, anything else on Harry? The romance was good, except for Nathan. The. I, I mean, I guess we'll talk about this with Snape, but the the half blood prints and the potions classes are really cool. Some of yeah, my Harry, favorite parts of the books. Harry finally actually gets a, I mean, Snape was a competent teacher, but not a willing teacher. So he finally gets someone that can actually teach him. Although twist, it was Snape that was actually teaching him stuff. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. what I mean, he he gets he gets the luck of the draw, right? Where he gets the book that was Snape's. What would yeah. have happened if Ron got that book? Then it's Ron Weasley and the Half Blood Prince. <laughs> then maybe Hermione being attracted to Ron could have been more believe. Uh, actually, never mind. I don't know. I was going down that path. <laughs> we can talk about the later with the Ron and Hermione section. I thought Harry had a great plan in tricking Ron into thinking that he drank the Felix Felicis yeah, potion. That was, a- that, that was really yeah. nice. That was a high for him. It was a low for Hermione, though, who displayed no trust in her friends. Yeah, the the Mike secret stuff moment from Harry yeah. Potter. Yeah, that's a really good, good. from Space Jam. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. That's good. <laughs> and then the Bezor save was huge. Oh, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Steven. I feel like that goes under the radar because Ron could have easily died. Yeah, but that, I mean, that, again, is all attributed to the potions book from Snape. Yeah. 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 So in a roundabout way, Snape actually saved Ron's life. Good old Severus. <laughs> and then the, a, a low decision for Harry in this one was the Sectrum Sempra. Like, really? We're just pulling out this spell that says four enemies. We, hey, we have that I, much I, trust I in the this book. This is a great Harry Wait. learning moment. Wait, but we just talked about how Malfoy kicked him in the face and left him on the train to die. Dude, Malfoy's in there crying. Malfoy's in there crying. You're going to cast this unknown spell. This easily could have been a death spell. Hey, the thing is, is that all <laughs> it probably books, would have been if Severus Draco, wasn't there. Draco was clearly Harry's number one enemy at school. The number one bully. I mean, Harry's well, had that's fine, but six years. I don't think using this untested spell is a good decision. You should have tested it on yeah. Crookshanks. Well, can't you just like point at the wall and see what happens first? Or I, I mean, not maybe maybe nothing. Maybe wall. nothing. I I don't know. I yeah, mean, t- it test does... it on, test it on like a Niffler or something. Ooh, uh, instant regret. Test 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 it on like a bow truckle. Something to carry <laughs> I mean, magical it creatures. Is a good Harry moment. A Scroot, maybe. That he can't use like these dark spells. Well, except Harry, he uses it later. Well, yeah, but Harry's trying to use unforgivable curses in book five in his death run against Bellatrix. 
Yeah, that's true. I do think that Harry shows quite a bit of remorse after he's in shock that he caused that much damage. So I, I think it was a half innocent mistake. Yeah, I, it, it maybe, didn't hurt my perception. So. It was a little reckless, but I don't know. All right, let's I'm, transition. I'm all for you. Let's transition to the guy that just got hit with Sectrum Semper. So Malfoy was really interesting in this book because he became much more sympathetic due to this mysterious task. You saw more of his character. He wasn't just a bully who had everything. Now he had all these things taken away and he had a lot of pressure or people around him were going to die and he was really struggling. So like, did Malfoy become any more sympathetic to you? Like, did you feel bad for him at all? No, not really. No. Really, never. I, I, I saw pretty much all of his actions based on just acting out of self-preservation. And he was put in an unfavorable situation, obviously. But everything that all the Malfoys do is, from what I can tell, is just being selfish. It's never, it's never trying to help others at all. But at least he's not pure evil. Because in, Actually, the, in the other books, we thought, oh, he's a bully. He uses these racist terms. And yeah. here, you know, maybe it is self-preservation. Maybe it's selfish. But at the same time, he's not a killer. And he really just does want to, like, survive him and his family. And you see that more in the seventh book, too. I yeah. felt a little bad for him. I, mean, I was going to yeah. say, in the seventh book, he shows really good. Or he shows humanity. I was just saying in this book specifically, I wasn't as impressed. Okay. I just feel like he's, I mean, like Dan said, he's just doing it to, so he can survive and that he doesn't let his parents down. I think that's all what it comes down to. But I, I will say the situation he's been put in, like it's a lose-lose situation. So I don't know what I'm expecting him to do, actually. Maybe I should give him a little bit more of a break. And the actual stuff that he's able to put together is pretty impressive because you don't, while speaking of reckless, like him just throwing out these cursed items and letting them be handled by other people, hoping that they can magically end up in Dumbledore's hands. Like, yeah, his plan seems really flawed with that. And it seems really dangerous. Like Katie Bell could have died. Slug yeah. could have died. Ron almost died. So that probably wasn't good. But him being able to put um, patch together the vanishing cabinet is really impressive. Going back to Dumbledore, actually, I should have shared this thought with Dumbledore. I always wondered. So Dumbledore reveals that he knew that Draco had been assigned to kill him this whole time. He knew that Draco was disappearing into different parts of the castle. Mm -hmm. How does he not understand that the vanishing cabinet and him putting like him invite creating a portal for the death eaters to enter the castle is really dangerous for all yeah. the Hogwarts students. Yeah. And Dumbledore totally. seems to just have let it happen. I, I just don't think Dumbledore knew that it was there. I mean, it's, but shouldn't he have like, shouldn't Snape be reporting back to him what's going on? But then, then they would have found out that Snape is a double agent. Yeah, but he, he Dumbledore could have caught Malfoy in the room of requirement or something like McGonagall could have yeah. found him there. It, yeah, I'm kind of with Dan. This does seem a little irresponsible of Albus. I don't know. I mean, the room of requirement has a bunch of, I mean, just stuff. I mean, Ah, I so, think he could have. He just overlooked Malfoy a little bit. I think he underestimated him. Yeah, I think, I think he didn't know the extent of Malfoy's actions. He probably knew he was going to the room of requirement. Didn't know exactly what he was doing. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think that was a flaw in Dumbledore. So not a perfect book for him. All right, let's go on to let's go to Snape. So at the beginning, he makes the unbreakable oh, vow. Snape, again, is another character like Dumbledore who is all in in his role. We'll talk more about this in the seventh book because this is super debatable. But he protects, he does really well in this book for what he's trying to do. He protects Malfoy to an extent. He fulfills what Dumbledore wanted him to do. He doesn't let Harry get killed at the end. He gets the defense against the Dark Arts post. He did an amazing job of fooling everyone. I mean, Snape's a jerk, yeah. but he did it really well. Yeah, I mean, I really like this book. It sets up uh, him for book seven um, and explaining his story. I mean, I just feel like Snape, I mean, throughout the whole series, it sets him up as like this evil professor that hates Harry 
and I mean, Dumbledore trusts him 100%, and I just feel like Snape fulfills everything that Dumbledore tells him to do. Yeah. And he's a really I mean, good actor. Yeah, and it goes into this, I mean, this kind of debate, like Stephen said, about why he has these motives that are revealed in Book 7. I just find it a little, a little iffy. But. Yeah, su- super controversial. We'll talk about that in our next review. Yeah, I have a lot to say about Snape, but I wanted to ask you guys, there's a sentence in the book that stuck out to me, and I wish I would have written it down, but you guys might remember it. But when he casts Avada Kedavra on Dumbledore, it says that he has like hate in his eyes or something. It says mm-hmm. something about his expression as he's doing it to let you know that it was meaningful. Like, obviously, it leads you further down that trail to like... Di- um incorrectly thinking that he's evil yeah. but what did you guys think about that because i was wondering i was maybe reading a little too much into it but maybe thinking that he in a way did resent dumbledore for putting him in this situation and he's kind of a tortured soul right he's never really had what he truly wanted in life and he's trying to be on the good side but really he's protecting this kid that he hates and he looks like his dad, who was his number one enemy while he was alive. And now Dumbledore is leaving him. And all of the other good people are going to hate him as a result of this action. Um, anyway, a really torn moment for Snape, for sure. And I was wondering if he actually, in a way, did mean the curse when he, when he killed Dumbledore. It's kind of a big question. Right. But Do was he totally the- was he totally sad while he was doing it? Or was there a little bit of it? There has to be some intention behind the Vada Kedavra, from what I understand, for it to take effect. Yeah. Think- so do yes, we read that much Nathan. into it? Yeah. Go ahead, Nathan. Well, I, I mean, just going back, I think uh, Dan, the line you mentioned is something about like hatred in his eyes or something that Harry sees or something like that. I just feel like for, I mean, the plan that set up that it is revealed in Book 7 that Dumbledore planned that for Snape to kill him is, I mean, I just feel like Snape had to hate Dumbledore enough for him to kill him. I mean, Dumbledore at this point, like his only friend or Snape's only friend kind of to a point is Dumbledore. Right. He's the only one that Dumbledore trusts. Or mm-hmm. Snape yeah, that's trusts. true stuff like that and so Snape has been learning and I mean been helping Dumbledore through all these years and then to a point where Dumbledore asks him to kill him yeah to ask him to do something that difficult yeah that difficult I feel like Snape had to hate Dumbledore enough to kill him Mm. for it to work I mean how would you feel if you're like if your only friend asked you to kill him yeah, and it's even more complicated than that because it's it's a very layered friendship with all of these, you know, double agent type of things going on. All obviously Voldemort looming in the background. I don't think Snape is as dedicated to the cause of taking down Voldemort as Dumbledore is. And while Dumbledore is willing to die for that, it puts Snape in this impossible situation where almost out of self-preservation now, he has to do it. And he's just totally trapped here. And like Dan said, he's a tortured soul. And so you feel terribly for him. And I don't know if it's necessarily like hated Dumbledore. I hated the situation or hated yeah, more the situation, I think. And I think himself as well. He, he certainly doesn't like who he is and he doesn't like his life. Um, so on a lighter note with Snape, the idea, so the Half-Blood Prince, all of the, all of the extra bonus spells and the stuff that he was able yeah. to uncover so super cool of Snape, right? Like you learn how accomplished of a wizard he was. I just wondered about the whole inventing spells process, like how he was uh-huh, able to come uh-huh. up with Levy Corpus and Sectum Centra. Is, is that something you can just try out saying different words and see if something happens? That makes no sense to me. Yeah, There might be some JK Rowling. <laughs> yeah, there might be some JK word? Rowling bonus stuff. I, I don't know, but I think it is pretty impressive to think that Snape had invented these spells. None of our current characters are like anywhere close to inventing spells (laughs) from what we've seen. Like back in the Snape, James, 
loop in serious days they yeah were they like made animagus, marauders map yeah making the maps yeah. animagus spells and here we are like uh, struggling to apparate like ron fails his apparition test <laughs> I, I think the one thing fred and george make some cool charms that they use for their oh yeah trick yeah. gadgets stuff yeah so maybe but we other just don't see that, enough of the charms class maybe that's yeah yeah hmm. All right, let's talk. Let's go on to Ron since I just threw him oh, under the bus. Wait, wait, wait. I have one more Snape thought. All right. So something that I felt was lacking was seeing more of Snape in the Defense Against the Dark Arts classroom because I felt like we could have seen him really blossom into the oh, professor yeah. that he never was as potions. He never felt fully comfortable in that position. It's kind of like, I'm trying to think of a sports example of someone who was in an unideal situation and then blossomed under a role that suited their talents more like maybe, maybe we, victor victor oladipo going to the pacers or something but anyway i mean if we can we just say like michael jordan playing baseball and then snape came and played basketball so michael jordan playing baseball is snape teaching potions yeah yeah but yeah so anyway was, because of the curtis even if he was the professor of the dark arts he can't be for more than one year well i mean snape knew that he wasn't going to be around to hogwarts after he killed dumbledore at the end of the year yeah well but except for he, he was, was he got promoted master. <laughs> well that's okay and yeah immediately proved wrong no but here's the thing if dumbledore i think that it could have made the end of the book a lot more compelling if we would have gotten a couple of scenes of harry learning to respect snape's defense against the dark arts abilities like oh, maybe yeah, he yeah. could have taught the students a couple of cool things and in a secretive way could have helped them prepare for death eaters more because nobody knows more about that stuff than snape yeah. And by doing so, Harry would have had no choice but to say, well, actually, I can see these few redeemable qualities about Snape. And then maybe he starts to grow to appreciate him more. And then the and then all that's even, ripped yeah. away at the end when he realized Snape actually yeah, does yeah. suck and was evil. Just a thought. That could have yeah, been even more that, impactful. That would have made an even worse ending. Just Harry's no, a better him. ending. More surprise. Well, worse for Harry, but stronger for the reader. Stronger yeah. in the novel. Yeah. I mean, it is pretty good when you realize that Snape is half a half blood prince, and he says, "Don't use my own spells against me." That's a nice ending. That's a sweet line. Yeah. yeah. Don't use my own spells against. Me. Yeah, and you're. Yeah, I was wondering because I remembered the whole book that Snape was the half blood prince, obviously, but I never remembered when it was revealed. So I was re waiting the whole book. Like Snape had a ton of chances to mm -hmm. reveal that to Harry, but he waited until the coolest time. Yeah, I mean, Snape had to know after, like him and. Or Harry and Draco fought. Yeah. So, but and they had a bunch of revealed. detentions together. <laughs> All right. So since I just threw Ron under the bus, let's talk about Ron. So Ron does like decent. This book, he does pretty well on his owls, surprisingly, on his OWLs at the beginning of the year. He gets keeper again, although Harry wasn't sure about it, but then he, he does well enough. So he does continue to be the keeper. Um, there are also some big low moments for Ron. But, and I'll talk about those in a, in a minute, but like overall, how did you guys like Ron in this one? I thought I Ron was Ron. Was, yeah, I mean, Ron is we'll always be Ron. I mean, just him. I mean, I thought it was pretty funny how he ate the love, like the chocolate. Yeah, big. Oh, yeah, from uh, R yeah. Romilda Vane. Yeah, yeah, that was that was really funny. Yeah, he loved potions himself and then he poisons himself shortly afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Really bad yeah. day for Ron. I think he also breaks up with Lavender because of it, which maybe yeah, was a yeah. good thing in the long run. Yeah. Yeah, because he says Hermione in his sleep in the hospital in wing. Uh-huh. Yeah. I I just thought it was funny. And just the whole romance between him and Lavender, I just feel like that's like so bad. So I didn't think it was that bad because I felt I, when Ginny chastises him for never having kissed anyone and she's like his younger sister and she basically calls him a loser and he knows that most of the stuff that she's saying is true. Uh-huh. Like he's got to, I mean, it's an appeal to his pride. Like he's got to try he's to He's got to take action. <laughs> yeah. as, as, as a man, he must do something. He's got to be a and, man for once. And I don't think Lavender, at least for Ron, I don't think it's a huge settle. I mean, Lavender, I, in the movie, she's completely ridiculous. Actually, in the book, she is too with all the Wan Wan stuff. Um, right. But she's not like the worst. 
Yeah. And how much can Ron, I mean, (laughs) we don't want to get down this too much because Nathan's going to go crazy, but you know, Ron's pretty middle of the road. I I don't know if he really deserves a 10, right? You know, he's probably fine with a six or seven. (laughs) But yeah, I thought that for a first girlfriend experience, I thought that lavender was just fine for Ron and he was awkward in ending things. He didn't know how to do it. Yep. And and so it's done for him. Yeah, he probably was a little bit of a jerk. Um, but yeah, I, I thought that Ron's attitude towards the half blood print stuff was good, though, in contrast to Hermione, because I didn't understand Hermione during that whole part, how she was so mad about like, how do you not mm-hmm. think that all the stuff that Harry's doing is cool? So really I have a reason. Friend? I have a reason for that. And I think that explains Hermione's character pretty well. We'll get to that when we get to Hermione. I do have a theory with that, too, in regards to like, Hermione never falling for Harry romantically I think it falls into that same aspect Mm. of her character okay let's let's focus on Ron we'll get to Hermione in a minute I think Ron gets dissed a few times there's actually a few really good disses in this book overall (laughs) so uh first of all Slughorn doesn't invite him oh yeah yeah (laughs) invites Harry and Hermione and Ginny nothing so that was tough Ginny totally disses him I mean you already (laughs) talked about this but she calls him out for his virgin lips. And then he gets all upset because he's like, wait, did Hermione kiss Crumb and he can't get over himself? <laughs> so yeah, he had some really down moments, but he that also was then, a really good supportive friend for Harry the whole time, actually. Yeah, that book. and Slughorn never calls Ron by his actual name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, poor guy. Yeah, there are some really funny moments in this book. There's a moment um, whenever Harry tries Levy Corpus for the first time in the room, and it's the situation that, I mean, Ron could have been freaking out, but he says something like, you can just use the alarm clock next time. Because uh-huh. he wakes up and all of a sudden he's strung by his ankles, like hanging upside down. I mean, that's probably pretty standard as a young wizard, right? All, that stuff's happening all the time. Yeah. I mean, it is a sad moment. Harry's getting all this hype from Slughorn and he's getting all these lessons from Dumbledore and Ron's just struggling along right so i i mean you that, kind of feel bad for him i will say at least he does have the taste of quidditch success from time to time because i feel like up until he nabs hermione like quidditch is the only really standout thing that he does mm-hmm. he's clearly the black sheep of the trio so speaking of slughorn nathan what do you think of Slughorn? This is a new character in this book. He plays a huge part. He's really selfish, obsessed with cultivating these young, promising wizards in his slug club. He's like an okay guy for me, but I mean, when it comes down to it, not a favorite character. Yeah, I mean, I kind of like him because it gives Harry, I mean, Slughorn taught his parents and so he, I mean, he obviously wants to learn more about his parents and everything like that. And I mean, it gives a reason yeah, for Harry yeah. to get closer to Slughorn. Um, That's true. And I mean, I, I kind of like him because he has like, he ha- has all these parties and all these like dinners. He invites like the students to go to. He actually I teaches just, potions. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah he's a pretty like, social aspect. Yeah, there's a lot going on with Slug. Yeah. Um, is potions potions is like the lamest class I realized. I don't know why it took me until the sixth book to realize this, but you're just following directions from a sheet. How do you mess it up? And what think, is there even to teach no, once you share no. the recipe? I, I think you're wrong here. But I think this how am is I coming wrong on this. This is coming from a perspective of someone who cooks things by just following a recipe and doesn't realize there's whole art to baking, et cetera. And so I think potions is very much the same. You can follow the recipe and get a very mediocre potion, but in order to really get the potion correct and really sparkle, there's a lot of things you have to kind of like know about the ingredients, et cetera, know intuitively how to combine them and I mean, you know, well, do yeah. the stirring well, backwards. Or the, I'm sure like, there, the, there's a science to all of it. Well, why doesn't somebody update the recipe book then in the potions books? Why don't, if the Half-Blood Prince was able to come up with it, weren't there some adults, wizards that were in charge of the publication of these books that could update it and give that half stir and the yeah. clock counterclockwise after the 12th stir? 
add those details in? It's probably also more about knowing how to, you know, develop new potions and what the qualities of the ingredients are. I see Ex that. Yeah. Yeah. But it's I've, not like they're inventing their own potions, except for they are in one point. I can't remember what one of those challenges is. Um, but, but it does work for one of the, yeah. oh, isn't it like an antidote potion that they're trying to make and Harry wins the challenge by just grabbing the bees or yeah, I think that is right. Yeah. I think the slug club is cool because it's actually not based on bloodlines. Like yeah. we've seen a lot of the other wizarding yeah, societies. I mean, it's totally merit based. Yeah. Um, he well, reminds kind me a of, little bit kind of. Because he also grabs people who just have famous parents, but then he's disappointed in you if you don't live up to the the promise that your parents have shown. For sure. He reminds me a little bit of Professor Lockhart because he has this fixa fixation on having connections with celebrity characters in the wizarding world and raising his status through that. I mean, in different ways, but they are a little bit similar. Like I think in, he's described in the book as dressing a little bit flamboyantly also mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so the, the professor he's most like from any of the current or proceeding i think for me was, was lockhart competent lockhart we'll say yeah equally selfish competent lockhart but he i think he sheds a new light on what it means to yep. be a slytherin he adds a more dynamic aspect to the slytherin yeah. house which before now was solely evil uh-huh but now you see the cunning side of it, which I think is perfectly captured when he manipulates Hagrid during the Aragog scene. Yeah, when he gets the Acromantula items by like feigning sympathy. I thought that was a really cool part for Slug. Uh huh. Uh huh. That whole sequence with the Felix potion and Harry saying, "Oh wait, I feel like I need to go to Hagrid's," and it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. That was a really fun moment. Yeah, from the, Hagrid's from the is the place to be. Uh huh. It's what. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was cool are we going to talk about the felix potion by the way how ridiculous it is or uh let's talk about it you think it's ridiculous <laughs> I, I think it's ridiculous how is it not ridiculous i'm gonna if it protects you in hand. battle like Ginny and um neville and ron and co they were all they were all uh -huh. talking about how felix felice saved them in the battle like, so you just think it's op I think it's way OP and it says that it takes like six months to brew, but that doesn't mean like, so start brewing it six months earlier, like start brewing it every day so you can have one. And so if I, you're going into business in the wizarding world, you just open up a Felix shop and then you're set because everyone needs that constantly. Well, I save it for myself and then I sell other goods. I open up okay. a different kind okay. of business because okay. I'm not sharing that with anyone else. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you can talk your way out of it. Like it can only work for inconsequential thing. And it does say if you take too large of doses, then it can be like a poison. So you yeah. definitely want to avoid that. But from time to time, I don't, I'm not seeing a downside to, to swallowing a bit with breakfast. Yeah. So the Felix is kind of like the time turner in book three, where it's really important for that book. And it doesn't really make yeah. sense. Like the time turner is like, oh, why didn't they use a time turner to bring Sirius back to library? You know, something like that. You know, time travel is always an issue. But here it's like, oh, we got this magical potion that will solve all your problems. Why don't you just always use it? And they don't. And, you know, there's not really like a super great reason for why. Like it's kind of explained a little bit, but you could find holes in it. But at the same time, that's just kind of like how it works sometimes in the magical community. Well, in the, in the book, it explains that you, if you drink it enough, then you'll just go crazy. I okay. Kind of yeah. So you got to do it in moderation. I don't know. All right. Felix, fun for this one. <laughs> yeah. Maybe there's some issues with it, but we'll, we'll move on. So let's talk about Hermione. Bad okay. book for Hermione. Yeah. Didn't, doesn't do very well. She starts yeah, off on wor a high. Worst performance so far for yeah. Hermione. She starts off on a high, getting almost perfect OWLs, except for Defense Against the Dark Arts, where she only only exceeds expectations not outstanding. i thought that was kind of a low because it's really annoying that she was complaining about that yeah like down in the I, dumps about it i guess yeah, that, you could she, see it i mean i she she complains the whole book it's a rough book she mm -hmm. pickers with ron for the latter half because she's jealous of lavender which is really kind of pathetic like lavender really hermione like 
you know, get it together a little bit, but you know, she's in a bad situation there. And then, she, and then she's like complaining about Harry in the, in the book and the half blood prince and yeah, everything was, that. she resorts to McLagan to get back at Ron. Yeah. I thought that was way lower than Ron kissing lavender. Yeah. McLagan was totally used. <laughs> yeah. Poor McLagan guy. was, was a known, I'm trying to think of a more appropriate word, you know, just kind of a jerk, just kind of totally full of himself. Uh huh. Like nobody likes McLaggen and doing it sh- just, just because of the Quidditch comparison because she knows Ron doesn't like him. Yeah, that, that was rough. The thing with the Half-Blood Prince book, so here's the thing with Hermione. Hermione's like always had this role in the friend group where she's the one who solves the problem. She's the brains behind the operation. And so if Harry's got this book that will solve all of these problems and teach him this stuff that Hermione can't do, then that's like threatening her role in the group. It's not a romantic thing. It's more of just like a defining who she is as a character and as a person. And so then she can't, you know, be that for her friends anymore. So I think that's why she doesn't like the Hot Blood Prince book. And yeah, I think I want to expand on that. Um, I referred to this before, but I think one of the reasons why Hermione isn't as drawn to Harry is because she knows that she needs to be with someone that she can control. That might be a little bit too strong of a way to say it, but something that's a little bit more submissive, a little bit more needy of her intellectual capabilities. Um, like, like Steven said, like she wants to be the brains behind the operation. She doesn't necessarily want to share that role. Mm. And she likes Ron and she, they get along with, they're very compatible in that way because Ron's willing to do for the most part, what Hermione suggests. And he's not going to necessarily have his own ideas and be as headstrong. Yeah. I think in that way, they are a pretty good match. But I guess is that Ron and Hermione bicker so much and they're so unlike. Yeah. Because they have, because they're unable to, you know, get their feelings sorted out and they're 16 years old. And sometimes it's a little tough to do this and especially with all the pressure that they're under so the bickering makes sense it's frustrating to read and we don't like it obviously but i think it reveals the depth of their of their attraction at least their teenage attraction to each other yeah they should have just communicated because i think hermione if she was able to i mean judging from how she's able to read other people's emotions throughout the book like how she helps harry with cho and such she should have caught on that Ron was pretty hung up on her, right? Like she should have been able to to gather that Ron had some feelings for her. Whereas Ron, on the other hand, I don't think Ron had any way of knowing that Hermione would have liked him back. So I think it's hard to ask Ron to really go out on a ledge and take that risk to damaging their friendship. Right. And to like be able to recognize those feelings within himself and then be able to express them to Hermione. So I think it's extremely unreasonable that Hermione took such offense to Ron going out and finding a girlfriend because it wasn't her. Yeah, but okay, that's fine that her, you, you noticed that Ron... So it makes sense that Hermione has been able to see this in other people. However, when you're trying to do this for yourself, sometimes it's not nearly as obvious and all kinds of doubts and self yeah, you know, ina- inadequacies some... come up to mind and there, there's a lot that plagues you when you try to, to handle things for yourself yeah. or help other people. Insecurity is going back to the buck teeth days, for sure. <laughs> I mean, she's uh-huh. 16 years old. I mean, these are yeah, teenagers. yeah, absolutely. One big low moment for Hermione was the her attempt. Thing? The birds. Yeah, the birds thing. Is that where you're getting at? Oh, the birds. Yeah. No, I was going towards the Borgen and Burks thing, where she tries to get What's info. The- at the beginning, she tries to go into Borgen and Burks and like oh, yeah, su- yeah. suss out what Draco is going for. And uh-huh. either Borgen or Burks, whichever one is there, oh. th- throws her out because he's like, okay, you're super suspicious and obviously not a real customer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I forgot about that. I thought you were going to talk about when she cast the birds, the killing birds on Ron. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know if that was a low moment. That was kind of a, a cool moment, at least. Cool magic moment. But- you were just getting so upset with Harry for casting Sectum Semtra on Draco, well, a word that's that I can't he, say, but at least he's an enemy. Well, come on. He didn't even know what Sectum Semtra was. He read it in a book. 
Hermione you knows know how what the birds are. Do you know it would are. hurt if a bird is going full speed and its beak is pointed at your oh, face? Oh, come on. It wasn't going to kill him. <laughs> that could do some serious <laughs> damage. It's fine. Just send him to the hospital wing. All right, let's go on to Ginny. So we loved Ginny in this one. She starts off a little low with her obvious jealousy towards Fleur, but she redeems herself really fast with the Zachariah Smith hex, the invitation to the slug club. Oh, yeah. And from there, she's killing it on the Quidditch pitch. She's dissing her brother in funny ways. She wins the, the cup. She's just cool the whole mm-hmm. way through. She's very confident coming into herself. So cool. Yeah, and at the end, you know, she gets together with Harry. It's great. <laughs> yeah, and you hear that all the boys in yeah, school I mean, basically I do, like her. I do like she has the plenty of series. Development uh-huh. between... between who, Nathan? Well, just the character development from Jeannie um, from book two to this book. I mean, in book two, she could barely talk to Harry. And it kind of talks about it a little bit in the book. And now she is really good friends with Harry and and then at the end of the book they're dating and then they break up or whatever um it just shows that character development and how Ginny has progressed as just an individual and how i mean i i agree she's i mean yeah in this book yeah really really easy to be a fan of Ginny. and to clarify they didn't break up they're just taking a break for friends fans out there so remember that (laughs) yeah yeah, I don't know if Ginny was doing it on purpose, but the strategy of pulling away, like you're obviously obsessed with someone like she is early on, which can be kind of off-putting to Harry. Right. And But she totally yeah. withdraws. I don't know how intentional her withdrawn, like moving on to other boys, like she had the Michael Corner phase, moving on to bigger and better things with Dean Thomas. And obviously that is um, drawing Harry's attention toward her. Oh yeah. So, so if, these, saying, if these other guys like her, then she must have, you know, she must be a commodity. So are you saying, Dan, that Ginny did it on purpose to make Harry jealous? No. She says, no, no, no. She says outright that she had always hoped, um, that she had always held the possibility, like in the back of her mind, that maybe Harry would like her. She had moved on, but the possibility was always open. Yeah. All right, let's move past Ginny and two more characters, then we're gonna do our top three. So real quickly, Hagrid, not a big role. Oh, man. Oh, man. (laughs) Yeah, Hagrid's always kind of funny. a joke in this book. (laughs) We we like to make fun of Hagrid. He also gets dissed terribly at the beginning of the book from none of the big three taking his class. (laughs) And then then he's easily pacified by Hermione saying that she will go with him to visit Aragog. Doesn't actually do it. They have the funeral. And there's not that much else that goes on with him, but it's the, the, it's a low for Hagrid. That's yeah. the only two things that he does in the whole book is he gets mad that no one takes his class and then he has a funeral for a spider that almost killed his friends. <laughs> like, I'm so over this guy. He is such a liability. Yeah. The one other thing. Yeah, so so it's... good. He's involved in some good emotional moments at the end when Dumbledore dies and Harry's with him there. And I think that really like hammers home the impact of Dumbledore's death seeing Hagrid's reaction to it as they're walking towards and Hagrid's disbelief that it could be Dumbledore and Hagrid crying out. And then at the funeral as Hagrid, you know, carries his body towards where it's going to be entombed. So those are really good moments, but I don't know if that's Hagrid as much as like Hagrid just being the vehicle for Dumbledore's coolness. I just think Hagrid's way too soft. Like it's clearly the like the only thing that really impacts him is stuff that he personally deals with. He could care less what's going on in the broader wizarding world. It just That's matters true. what's going on in his hut. Yeah, he's a little. And sad. I have a hard time <laughs> respecting that. <laughs> like That's he's fair. sad about Dumbledore because Dumbledore gave him a place to, to have a career. I mean, he does love Harry. He goes out of his way to help Harry as much as he can, even if it doesn't. Even if it's not always that helpful. Yeah. Yeah, that's true because he loved and cared for Harry before Harry could even reciprocate any of that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So past Hagrid, let's talk about Voldemort. So Voldemort, not actually in the story per se, it's more of his memory and what we're learning about his character through all of these memories that Dumbledore and Harry are exploring. So for me, this is cool because of the parallel between Voldemort and Harry 
Both of them are half blood. Both of them are orphaned. Voldemort goes the complete opposite way than Harry. And in the end, it's all about love, right? Harry is willing to forgive, willing to love people around him. Voldemort is all about wanting to cast off this negative part of himself to a point where he's murdering and is totally hateful and just kind of a loser. And yeah, well, there's so much backstory in this book and a lot of the exposition is necessary for book seven. But how creepy is Voldemort the orphan as described by the orphanage keeper? Those are some pretty chilling scenes. Well, all of the, the gaunt stuff, all of the pensive stuff in this is really dark. Um, but some of my favorite parts of the book, um, like normally I don't really like the plot points that aren't current, but in this, I, I thought contributed a lot to our understanding. But like the orphanage keeper, she says, she's even she's clearly scared of tom riddle Mm -hmm. and she says all the other kids are scared and she wants to make sure before she says anything about him that dumbledore is for sure gonna whisk him away to the school Uh and then she just unloads the stuff like oh he took um he took these kids to this cave and they were never the same and you hear about the he hung he hung the kid's pet rabbit from a noose and he's so power hungry tom riddle the kid is the creepy kid from some horror movie yeah, he, he missed his calling there as a horror movie cast member. Yeah, so I liked I liked those parts. And I liked, uh, actually, him sending Draco off to kill Dumbledore was so cruel. Because we I said that's a lose-lose situation before. Like, he for sure didn't think that Draco was going to be successful in that. Totally expendable. Mm-hmm. Maybe Draco drums up some useful bit of information, but if he doesn't and he dies, you know, who cares? That's how Voldemort's viewing it. I think one thing, when you see his application to be the Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher, that also cements his similarity to Harry because Hogwarts is his home and he has this strong attachment to it to the point that like 10 years after he graduated, after he'd cast off the name of Tom Riddle and became Lord Voldemort, He's even like, he's still got this connection. He's like, well, maybe I could just go back to Hogwarts and be a teacher and I'd have to be under Dumbledore, but you know, it still might be not a bad way to go. And like, that's kind of his last thing before he decides to be completely evil Dark Lord. What's the point where he finds out about the history of his, his mom and dad? I can't remember at what point in the book that that's revealed to him. Well, he he goes, he starts hating muggles. Um, I can't remember what point. I mean, he goes back to the Gaunt house where one of them, don't remember which one is still there. And then he goes off and right. he kills all of his muggle progenitors. Yeah. Well, not, not that he didn't hate muggles before that. Cause he was obviously proud of his wizard blood from the very beginning and thought that he was so strong because he had, he, he must've descended from a, a great wizard line. One thing, really cool cave defense. I mean, if you're going to defend a piece of magical, you know, magical artifact that's got to be a bit of your soul, why not have a lake and zombies and, yeah, very difficult to extract. That kills you. Yeah, the killing potion. Although, question on that, like, why not make the potion actually kill you? Why make it possible at all? Yeah, you know, kind of just kind of another plot thing. Well, because he but, has to have a way to retrieve it. Oh, but he could just sacrifice. He could bring along a yeah, servant and sacrifice right, them. Right. But very cool magic in, involved here. Yeah. So are we done with all the characters now? Yeah, I think we're done with characters. So let's quickly wrap oh. up with our top and <laughs> bottom three. No, no, nothing else. Top <laughs> I can say some. Rufus Scrimgeour could have been so much cooler. Why was he basically just the same as as Fudge, just like the slightly more competent version of Fudge? No, but Dan. He was still no, just he a can, corrupt politician. No, he no, could have been no. cooler. He, he can be on your bottom three if you feel that way. He, he could have been book. a half ally to Harry somehow. He Dan, could have been Dan more important to the plot. In the seventh book. He was totally a meh character. He he provided nothing. Yeah, he was a loser, especially in the seventh. All right. So Dan's Dan, going to start us off with his. Dan's going to start us off with his bottom three. 
No, I'm not going to start off because I didn't know that we were talking about the top and bottom three because I thought we were just discussing as we went along. So I need a little bit more time to think about it. All right. Top three characters. Again, these are not the top three in our favorites. They're the top three in their performances in the book. So Nathan, tell us your top three. Just briefly, three. like like rattle them off. And if it's controversial, you can defend it. Otherwise, just say who they are. Okay. Top three. Number three is going to be Dumbledore. Um, number two is Harry and number one is, uh, going to be Draco. Ooh, Draco. Okay. Draco because of his plan that came together. Right. And he got the death eaters in yeah. and everything, even though he was like throwing around powerful de deathly artifacts and poisons. Yeah. Even though. <laughs> All right, Dan, what are your top three? Okay, Ginny's for sure in my top three. I got to think about the other ones. I might put another Weasley in here, actually. I might, I'm going to put in Ron because Ron um, gets to be with Hermione via Lavender, right? Okay. A nice stepping stone to his, his deepest desire. Uh -huh. And then my other for the top three is probably just going to be Harry. Yeah, probably just going to be Harry. Just a Harry. Okay, Harry's appeared in both of yours. I'm going to say top three. Uh, Snape is in there. Snape is in there for sure. It's Snape, Dumbledore, and Harry, I think. I mean, Ginny as well was great, but I don't think we can be too creative in this one and still be believable. Those were the top three characters. Okay. All right, bottom three. Okay. Nathan, who stunk in this book? <laughs> Bottom three. So number number three um, is going to be a uh, Hermione. Um, yeah, rough two for her. is uh, a character that we didn't really talk about was McGonagall. Um, mm. And number yeah. one is probably going to be. Uh, mm, Number one is going to be Voldemort. Ooh, okay. Ooh, interesting. Why, uh, why Voldemort they, to McGonagall? Um, so Voldemort, I just feel like, so he knew that Draco was going to bring and have the Death Eaters come, right? So why didn't Voldemort come with the Death Eaters and then Voldemort just take over the school and try to kill Harry then? Yeah, they finally had an inn into the castle. Because he knew that Dumbledore exploited. was dead, right? When the Death Eaters went there. And so... So after Dumbledore not... was killed, then Voldemort should have came in too? Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. The McGonagall one, McGonagall has kind of a bad moment with Harry at the end. or I don't know if, who it's bad for, Harry or McGonagall, but she's trying to get information and Harry totally... Um, just brushes her off mm -hmm. like she's yeah, scrimgeour or something yeah yeah that's lame especially after dumbledore finally takes harry into his confidence okay dan yours okay i have some unique picks for this uh i'm gonna go i'm gonna go fred and george in the bottom three because turns out they sold draco peruvian instant dark powder which was key to mm. his whole plot. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and eventually led to Dumbledore's death. So they should have been more selective in their customer base. Okay. I guess so. Um, but actually that's a slippery slope because that's like saying gun owners are responsible for all the people that buy their guns if they murder someone. Yeah. Um, and, and we're not going to get political. So, so we're not. But best so, to move on. <laughs> so then I thought that Lupin, all right, follow me on this one, guys. How does Lupin not make it his life goal to get back at Fenrir Greyback? I was wondering this on my recent reread. Fenrir Greyback bites not <laughs> only Lupin, but uh -huh. we assume a lot of other kids, a lot of other innocent kids, and ruins their whole lives. So it should have been and a side Lupin, story of Lupin getting at him? Yeah, Lupin had a lot of weapons at his disposal. He had Sirius as an accomplice that no one else knew was alive. And Sirius had, was itching to do something. Sirius would have been yeah. so down to do something like this. And it's not just revenge. It's also to help out the entire wizarding world because he was yeah. still he was still at large. 
Especially so, after we dissed the Order of the Phoenix for doing nothing in the fifth book. This would have been a nice little thing for them to do. Yeah, I'm glad that you're with me on this one, Steven. Uh-huh. Um, other bottom three, Hagrid. Who are your, who's your bottom three? Hagrid, nothing more needs to be said. Lupin also messes up with Tonks when he refuses to pursue a relationship. And Tonks is like, look, Fleur still loves oh. Bill, even though, you know, Bill Wait, is that be a scene werewolf. is so weird. How are they having this like talk show romance moment in the hospital wing in front of everyone? Like, yeah. I still love you for you. I don't care what you look like. <laughs> That's so weird. A little bit. All right. Mine, I'm. Ge- <laughs> Bless you. Okay, I'm going to have McLaggen in mine. Oh, yeah, McLaggen's the worst. Because he's, <laughs> he's a square and a loser. And I'm also going to throw Slughorn in there. I think purely because he gives Tom Riddle the Horcrux information. That was, that was terrible. And then... And then holds on to it, even though that he knows that the memory is necessary yeah, for, he finally, for writing his wrong. He totally understands. He finally gives it up, but only because he's dead drunk. He's and then finally, drunk. I'm going Crab and Goyle, who agree to submit to transforming into first-year girls to go along with Draco's plan. How <laughs> embarrassing, and do you have zero self-respect? <laughs> that is terrible. That's true. All right. Thanks for listening to our Half Blood Prince review. We only have one more of these to do. And then maybe we'll have to do some Harry Potter tier list or some kind of fun video. So we still have Harry Potter content coming out. Let us know in the comments what you'd like us to do. If you'd like to chat with us more, hop on Discord and choose the Harry Potter role. And you can go and tell us all of your Harry Potter theories. You know, there's a lot of Potterheads out there. If you like Phantology, check us out at www.phantologybooks. You can see our full lineup of all our different episodes and finally if you'd like to support the show you can find that at patreon.com slash phantology underscore books so thanks guys any more dan any more wizard dad jokes to send us out are we good i'm gonna save those for the next one all right just give us a non-verbal spell then on our way out oh you got it all right see you nathan